Good morning, and welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. Ye brave few. They said we would only have three. We have almost 10. Yes, there we go. There we go. Um, and I hope for all of you watching online that you are curled up in a warm blanket with a cup of hot coffee or cocoa or tea, um, and that your power is on and your home is unperturbed by branches. Um, but regardless of whether the storms come, we still worship God, don't we? That God is still great, God is still good, and God is here with us this morning at Trinity. God is with you at home as you watch online. And God loves us so much. A um, couple of announcements this morning. One, I'm not preaching. Woohoo! And instead, we have a guest preacher, Reverend Walter Strother, coming to us from the conference office. Um, he has been a pastor in our conference and is now serving the wider church in the Columbia and Hartsville districts, focusing especially on African American congregations. So we're excited to have him here with us this morning to give a word. I'm excited to have a week off. Excited that. With this one and then two more Sundays that we'll have um, Reverend Smoke back and hope that his renewal leave is going well. Um, a couple of quick announcements. Um, one, the Monday Morning Ladies Bible Study is welcoming newcomers for their study Better by Jen Wilkin. That's at 9.30 a.m. in the Eminon classroom right here. Um, and we're also trying this little time we're calling Meet the Pastors, um, although next week it will just be meet the pastor singular, me. Um, but I'm relatively new here. You know, I've only been here for six months. Um, some of you may be wanting to get to know me. And we've also had a lot of folks visit in the church. So this is a great time um, either for me to get to know you or you to get to know me, both, neither. Um, but we'll have some donuts there. That'll be during our connection hour um, between the services from 1015 to 1115 next week. And donuts will be provided. So even if you don't want to know me, maybe you want to get to know a donut. Um, I think that's all I have, except that we do have our blood drive coming up next month. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, God above the storm, God of fire and ice, Lord, we ask that you dwell with us this morning that you make us to be a little more like you as we sing praises to you, as we hear your word, as we give thanks to you and rejoice that you have revealed yourself to us, God. We give you thanks for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, be with us now. Make us yours. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings. We're going to read Psalms 36, 5 through 10. Your steadfast, steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness, your, your righteousness is, like, is like, like the mighty mountains. Your, your judgments judgment, are Lord. like the great deep. You save Jesus humans and animals Jesus. alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. 
All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, your salvation to the upright of heart. And now we're going to sing the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, uh, number 519. illumination. Uh, Lord, open your eyes. Lord, let me try this again. The Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear the joy that you say to us today. Amen. Amen. Gospel lesson is John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the, wine, um, when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. 
and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw out some and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. Then the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it, had, where it came from, though the stu stewards, the servants, who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first and then the inferior w wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory to the disciples uh, and his disciples believed in him. John 2, 1 through 11. Amen. Well, our soloist for this morning is not here. Um, and so I will proceed with the shoulders moment. And I guess this is just between me and you. How's that sound? Um, so one of the things that makes Christians special is that we believe that God is one and God is three. And today we're especially looking at God, the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says a lot of things about the Holy Spirit, but one of those is that the Holy Spirit is the love of God poured out in our hearts. So the way that we love is because God, the Holy Spirit, as Christians, dwells within us. Um, but another thing that the Holy Spirit says, this is what Walter's preaching on this morning. The Holy Spirit is the way that we as Christians are held together, that we are made like one body. And so sometimes, like Paul talks about, the, like some of us are like the feet, some of us are the hands, some of us are the ears, eyes, nose. Um, but the thing is, as a body, we kind of need the whole body, right? Like if we, you know, the head might think the head's special because inside the head is a brain. But the head's going to have a hard time getting places without feet. So we need the feet too. Um, we need all of the body to work together. And so in that passage, which Reverend Strathler will be preaching on, it says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Manifestation is kind of a fancy word. It means something like epiphany, which we've been talking about. But it is especially just like an appearance. It is how the spirit is shown in our lives, um, and it's for the good of each other. So we're held together by the spirit. The spirit shows up in each of us as the body of Christ, whether we're the foot of Christ or his hand. And through us, the spirit helps each other out. Isn't that good news? It is good news. Let's say a prayer. A repeat after me prayer that everybody's going to repeat after me in lieu of very many children. Dear God, thank you that you have made us into the body of Christ by your Holy Spirit. By your Spirit, show your love through us for each other's good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, since you're the acolyte, you're going to have to stay here. You don't get to go to Children's Church. I'm very sorry. But I will come sit down over here while Reverend Strother preaches. Well, good morning. Good morning. And good morning to those who are joining us via social media, t uh, Facebook, and what have you. I give you bring you greetings in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who looked down throughout eternity and saw a kid named Walter and said, that boy's going to need saving because he is he's going to be hard-headed, he's going to be stiff-necked, and I'm going to need to save him from his sins, and I'm thankful to Jesus for that. And uh, I greet you in that name of Jesus Christ. I acknowledge our resident bishop, Bishop Holston. Uh, I acknowledge the pastor of this church, Reverend Scott Smoke and your associate pastor, Karsten Bryant. So glad to be with you this morning. And uh, I want to recognize uh, Miss Tony Strother, who uh, calls me husband. And, uh, and so glad that she has accompanied me this morning. Uh, so I will go into what I've come to do. And I invite you to hear this reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. 
Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but one spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Loving God, it's preaching time. But God, if you don't speak, nothing worth hearing will be said. So speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. <clears throat> so this weekend is, is MLK weekend. Tomorrow is the official federal holiday, but throughout the United States and even throughout the world, people will be celebrating the life and ministry of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., as you may be well aware, Dr. King was a champion for human rights. He fought, a, fought for peace and justice. And much, at least what, as I prepare for this morning, much of what I read in this portion of Paul letters, Paul's letter to the community of believers at Corinth, much of that is reflected in the way that Dr. King uh, carried himself and the, the teachings and the, and the sermons and speeches that he gave. Both Paul and Dr. King sought to oppose the notion that one group of people is superior to another group of people. Both make a plea for unity, a unity that is grounded and based in the belief of the God of creation. Neither man, at least from what I've seen, neither man seeks to add to the division by condemning one side or or making folks feel guilty. Rather, it is an invitation that both extend to join this oneness that we have in the spirit. They invite all people to come to the saving knowledge of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But at the same time, this plea for unity is not a plea for conformity. It's not a relativism. It's not a, a, a everything goes, a universalism. There is a right and there is a wrong. Diversity exists and there, and there is a place for recognizing individualism. It, you don't have to lose yourself to be part of this oneness. However, differences don't justify hierarchies, according to both men. Differences do not justify hierarchies, particularly when those hierarchies cause harm, cause injustice, causes abuse particularly when that, when that hierarchy creates division, where one is better than the other. So for just a little while this morning, I want us to consider what Paul, Paul says to us and what Dr. King says to us through their words and through their life that lead us to this, to this being able to live as one in the spirit. And so we begin with Paul. As he responds to a letter that he has received from the believers at Corinth. Now, we don't have access to this letter, 
We don't know what they wrote to him, but we just have what he wrote back to them. But based on the context clues, uh, you know, my ninth grade, tenth grade English teachers would be glad that that stuck with me, context clues. Based on those context clues, it appears that the Corinthians asked Paul about spiritual things. That's, that's what it appears, because in verse, that first verse he says, now concerning, so he, if you read chapter 11, of, of, of First Corinthians, there's a switch. That first verse makes a switch. Now concerning, so it seems as if they're asking him about spiritual things. But if you look at most English translations, you'll miss that because most English translations have that first verse, that word there, uh, that Greek word, uh, it's translated as spiritual gifts instead of spiritual things. And now, uh, you know, beyond trying to justify my seminary uh, education and the cost that, that was associated with it, this actually comes, it makes a difference. Seems like a small thing, spiritual things versus spiritual gifts, but it makes a difference because what Paul says next uh, is talking about what it means, the difference between living in the spirit, and I know we read, I believe we read the New Revised Standard, but the, in the English Standard and even the King James, it's not by the Spirit in verse 4. It's in the Spirit. By uh, indicates some uh, 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 a means. But in means possession. If we're possessed by the Holy Spirit, right? And, and you know, again, that's gotten a bad rap because of movies and televisions. To be possessed is to have your head spin around and, you know, spit up pea soup. But being possessed by the Holy Spirit is a good thing. That's what we want. I want to be in the Spirit. So that's the difference between spiritual things. Paul says to be in the Spirit, to know about spiritual things, is to understand two metrics, two rubrics that Paul puts before us here. If you're in the Spirit of God, if you're under the, the possession of God the Holy Spirit, then you cannot say... Let Jesus be cursed. Now, I just said it. <laughs> it, it, it. And likewise, the other part of that, you cannot say Jesus is Lord unless you're in the Spirit. Now, then he goes on. Once he gets past that first verse, he comes back in, in verse 4, and he uses another Greek word. That actually is spiritual gifts. He uses charismata, where we get charisma. And this distinction points out a thing, for, uh, it made a point, at least in my mind, what I heard was we need to understand what spiritual things are, what it means to live in the spirit before we talk about spiritual gifts. See, that was the problem in Corinth. They thought their spiritual gifts, somebody could seem pretty good. Right? Some people could preach pretty well. And other folks could pray good. And each one of them thought because they could do that spiritual gift thing that they were better than the singer and the prayer and the other folk. And that caused division. And Paul says, y'all don't know what it means to live in the spirit. Y'all don't know about spiritual things if you think your gifts from the one spirit makes you better than someone else. And what you're doing is destroying God's church. He wouldn't use the word church. You're destroying God, the, the message that is coming forth. You're, you're destroying what God intended. God did not give you those spiritual gifts so that y'all could bicker, bicker and fight with one another and there would be division created. God gave you those spiritual gifts, as he says in verse 7, for the betterment of all. For the common good. So, what did that? I said that I, I just said that no one by the Spirit can say that Jesus is cursed, but then I said, I'm saying Jesus is cursed each time I say it. It's not that you're just saying the thing, it's that you're living into it. That's the difference between understanding a spirit, the spiritual thing versus the spiritual gift. 
If I understand the spiritual thing, then I will use my gifts. I will use my ability to preach, to teach for the good, for the common good. There have been many people throughout the history of the world, and I'll just warn you, I was a history teacher in a prior life before I became a minister, so I won't go down. I won't give you a history lesson, I promise. <clears throat> but there have been many people throughout the course of history who've had the ability to speak and speak well, and they have used that ability to cause a lot of destruction, death, and harm in this world. You can use your gifts for your own good, for your own benefit, for destruction and, 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 and death, or you can use your gifts for the good, for the common good. So what, we, what, we, what we're talking about here, this Corinthian Gentile Christian community, they, they were holding up their abilities to do different things, to, to have different types of gifts, as if that gave them the authority to be, to have power and control, right? So, so Paul's words comes crashing in on them. Paul makes it clear that there is no room for boasting or self-congratulation because these gifts, these service, this service, these activities, they are all the work of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? L listen to what he says again in these verses. In, in, he says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, Holy Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and we know that Jesus is Lord. There's yet the Son. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God, God the Father, who activates them, you know. Paul wouldn't have used this word, but he just laid out the Holy Trinity, as Reverend Brian pointed out during the, the children's message there. Just as God, God's self, is a community in the Trinity, it's a three in one. Just as God is a community, all of us who are believers in the Spirit are one. In God, there is distinction, but there is no difference. I thought somebody might say amen. amen. There is <laughs> distinction, but no difference. Amen. I know there's only a few of us, but <laughs> we who have been spiritually gift, gifted, and, 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 and hear me when I say this, I, I want you to hear this. Now. We who have been spiritually gifted, and that includes everyone. There is not one person walking on the face of the earth who is not spiritually gifted. We who have been spiritually gifted can't boast about our gifts if we're truly in the spirit. At best, all we are are delivery agents of the message of God. That's all we are. We are, we are delivery agents. And we, and we ought to be thankful that God wants to deal with us. Because I told you, Jesus looked down and said, that knucklehead's going to need saving. He's he going to be hard-headed. I don't deserve these gifts that God has given me. It's a favor. It is a grace that God has given spiritual gifts to us. All right. So it's the triune God who works in and through us that gives us these gifts. And so we can't boast. We can't brag. We can't, we can't act like we're better than anyone else because we're not. No matter what your gifts are, the gifts were not given for you and for your benefit. They were given for the community, for the common good. So we hear in Paul's words that, that we, ought to, we ought to be one in the spirit. So similarly, Dr. King sought to dismantle a hierarchy in the United States of America. This hierarchy was built on race. And Dr. King saw the egalitarian nature of Christianity, and he said, he is quoted as saying, if you want to be important, wonderful. <laughs> if you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. 
That's a new definition of greatness. By giving this definition of greatness, it means that everyone can be great because everybody can serve. Everybody can serve. And then when I did a little more studying, and the, the, one of the connotations for service, as Paul uses it, is that it includes this idea of being an intermediary. That is to say that we would do, when we do our service, we are representing, or as someone else said, we are representing God to other human beings. So our, our Christian service ought to be grounded in allegiance to God, back to that idea that Jesus is Lord. The, this understanding of service makes it impossible to justify any kind of hierarchy, but specifically racism and white supremacy. If we are all gifted and engaged in service based on our allegiance to Jesus as Lord, then our allegiance or source of service cannot be accounted for by race. Put simply, racism, white supremacy stands in direct opposition to the confession that Jesus is Lord. If you are providing service to someone feeling like you're doing something special for them, instead of representing God to them, then you're saying Jesus is cursed. I knew I wouldn't get no amen right there. <laughs> Do you hear? If we, if we think that I am doing something for someone else out of my goodness. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't like y'all. Y'all act like I don't know what I'm talking about. If we think we can, we're representing ourselves as if we have put ourselves in these positions to be able to serve others, instead of understanding that we are simple intermediaries, we are simply the deliverers of what God has given to us for their benefit, then we are not, we, we're not, it's not, Jesus isn't Lord. Jesus is cursed. If Jesus is my Lord, then I'm going in understanding that I'm the same as the person I'm serving. I'm exactly the same. They might not have the clothes I have in my closet. They might not have the food that I have in my pet, but they are the, I'm the same as that person. Doesn't make me no smarter makes me no better. I'm the same if Jesus is Lord. That's what Dr. King is saying. Everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Everyone can represent God to someone else. And then King is quoted as saying, every man, and of course, today we say every person, but I'm going to quote him directly. Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Being in the spirit leads us to the light that is Jesus Christ and the understanding that our activity that is animated by God the Father, our activity is an energy that is intended for the good of all, not for selfish ambition. There is no room for staking a claim to economic, social, political, religious, or educational advantage based on any criteria. There is no, there's no category that we human beings can place on ourselves that would make it okay to have an educational, political, social, religious, political, any kind of advantage over another group of people. But yet, in this country, there still exists a wealth gap. There still exists an education gap. Your zip code determines what kind of education you'll get, and most likely what kind of job you end up in, and what kind of life you'll have. No race, no gender, or spiritual acumen can serve as a foundation for discrimination, oppression, or abuse. Acting outside the condition of being in the spirit of God, human beings are prone to destructive behaviors. Dr. King recognized that this behavior was not only destructive to those on the receiving end, but those who are perpetuating it. Seminary professor said, you can't sin without hurting yourself. You can't sin without causing your own death. 
And that's what I think we miss in both Dr. King's words and Paul's words. We miss just how radical this message is. During Roman time, there was very much a hierarchy. There was very much stratus in the, in the class system. And for Paul to say that we are all the same when we come together in this community of believers was radical. For Dr. King to speak in the, 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 the society that we lived in in America at that time, for him to say that, all, that, that we, everybody can be great because everybody can serve was radical. I think we miss that. We lose some of that in today's world. But unfortunately, we still need to hear this message today. Unfortunately, today in our society and even in our church, uh, we, we, we need to hear this message because another King's quote comes to mind. It is, appeal, it is appalling, I should say. It is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Now, I know you've heard that before, and we would agree that Christians today would agree that that, that is still an appalling, that is an appalling condition, but when we look around at our churches, it is still a true statement. I believe that the continuation of this condition means that we are living outside of God the Holy Spirit. I believe that God is calling us to unity, to oneness in the Spirit, so that the gift of diversity can be harnessed into the blessing of a better society and a stronger church. The church is strong. Don't misunderstand me. I believe the church does great work. But what if we really embrace the diversity that God has given to us? What if we used our gifts for the common good regardless of race, creed, color, all those other things that we made up in order to divide one another? We are familiar <laughs> with these things. We, we, but, but again, I, I think we, we've lost the, the radical nature of what they are proposing. What would the church look like if we were true, truly united? What would the church look like if we uh, uh, confessed that, that Jesus is Lord and meant it and stood by it? What would the church look like if we recognized the gifts and graces that God the Father has bestowed on all people? especially the people we, we don't think have any gifts or graces. What would the church look like? In the United Methodist Church, we claim an open itinerancy. What that means is as a full elder, in full connection to, to the South Carolina Annual Conference, no pulpit within this conference ought to be off limits to me. The bishop and his cabinet, when they meet, ought to be able to assign me to any church within the confines of the South Carolina Annual Conference. But the truth of the matter is, there are churches within South Carolina Annual Conference that would not accept me as a pastor. I don't know if you noticed, I'm (laughs) African-American. This is not a condemnation. I'm not looking for sympathy, I'm not looking for guilt. It's a statement of fact. There are places where I would not be welcomed as the pastor. Not because I lack gifts. Not because I lack leadership skills. I ain't going to say no more. I'm probably already in enough trouble. But we, what I'm saying is we still have work to do if we're going to truly be the church God has called us to be. For us to tolerate racism, and again, I don't have the answer. It would, be, it would be wrong to send someone, any pastor, woman, black, doesn't matter, any pastor, it would be a sin to send that person into a situation where they're not wanted. And it would be, it would be kind of evil and cruel to the congregation itself. But what can we do? God has given us the gifts. What can we do to change that so that we live in the spirit? possessed by God and the Holy Spirit so that all gifts are appreciated, all people are seen as valuable, and we live as one in the Spirit. Think about how more powerful the church would be. And here's the good news. I know I've laid it on thick right there, and I saw how your faces changed. I'm sorry. 
But, but here's the good news. Although we, we still face the sin of racism and white supremacy, there, and there are still those who believe that their gifts, some people actually believe because they give more money to the church that they ought to have more say. People really believe that. I know they don't believe that here at Trinity. No. Blackwood. I know they don't believe that here. But there are people who believe because I give more money than Sister Sue that I ought to have a bigger and better say. We face that. And, and, and even though there are people who believe they're entitled to power and authority based on stuff that they have that comes from God, God the Holy Spirit is still working within us to bring about the changes that need to take place. Our triune God is putting people in places with an understanding of spiritual things and spiritual gifts needed to impact the lives of others. And I reject the claim. I've heard people say, well, we'll never get rid of racism. I reject that claim. Because... To believe that is to make my God too small. I believe the God who created the whole universe. So that, that God can get rid of racism today. Not tomorrow. Today, right now. We could get rid of racism if we lived in the spirit. So I reject that claim that, that, that we will never be able to. I reject the notion that our cultural differences keep us segregated on Sunday mornings. That's another one that I've heard. The reason why we have black and white churches is because, well, the music and the type of preaching and bull malarkey. Donkey dust is what I say to that. I reject that notion that our cultural differences keep us segregated on Sunday mornings. A belief in such a claim as that would make scripture into a lie because I read in Colossians First chapter, verses 19 and 20, that Jesus came to reconcile all creation unto himself. So I'm back to Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then we're all reconciled to the same person, the same God who is also man. And if we're all reconciled to the same person, then we can all worship together because we worship in the same, same person. Amen, somebody? Amen. Jesus came... To reconcile. So I reject that notion. I also reject the, reject the notion that there will always be division. That, that we will always be homo homogenous in, in, in our racial nature to the church. The, the spiritual hierarchy that keeps us divided uh, in, that, in that sense. And this belief to me is antithetical to Paul's claim that we are one in the spirit. And we were made to be community just as God is community. Because we are one in the spirit, we can come together, and not just on this MLK day. I, I may not get invited back because I know I said a lot here this morning. But, but not just, a, but every time we worship, we worship the same triune God. That's what we say. And because we're one in the spirit, we can combine our various gifts, our service and activities so that God is glorified. Because we are one in the spirit. We are not bound by societal norms, political affiliations, or any other human-made barriers that are designed to keep us separated. Because we are all one in the Spirit, we claim Jesus to be our Lord. And that ought to bring us together in unity. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray in time. So let us pray. Unifying God. Reconciling God. We come before you giving thanks for your word. A word that is challenging to us. While also being encouraging to us. A word that is hard sometimes to hear for us. But Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to receive it. We pray that you would empower us to act on it, on what we have heard. We pray that we find ways to use our gifts, our graces, so that we become the people that you have intended for us to be all alone. We pray, God, that our barriers will be knocked down. Those things that divide us will be eliminated. 
Help us, Lord. Fill us once again with your precious Holy Spirit. And now, Lord, we also pray for those who are suffering in any types of ways, uh, whether it's a health condition or financial distress, whatever it may be, God. Specifically, we pray for those that are still ex uh, experiencing this pandemic, this coronavirus and the new variant, Omicron. Lord, we pray that there will be a healing. We continue to believe you that that. All things work together for those who, who are called according to your purpose, Lord. And so we believe, Lord, that there is a healing that is coming. We believe that there is a recovery that is coming, that this won't be always. And Lord, we continue to, to lift up in prayer this congregation, this specific congregation here at Trinity in Blythewood. Ask that you would bless those, the pastors and leaders, the officers uh, throughout this congregation, that they may reflect your love to this community that they serve. All these things we ask, God, and we believe that they are done because you are faithful. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Strother, for preaching. Yeah. And I know you said we're not going to have you back, but we're going to have to have you back so we can actually show you that we have more than 10 in the congregation. <laughs> we are like a real normal-sized church, um, just not when it's storming. Yeah. So we'll have to have you back. Um, well, one spiritual gift which God has invited all of us to is financial generosity. No, no clapping. Okay, no amen. That's fine. Um, that's fine. Um, since we are only a few and we don't have ushers here this morning, if you'd like to leave something in the plate, um, and we'll make sure to get that where it needs to go after the service. Um, we also have online giving available, or if you want to just bring something by the church, that goes for all of you online, watching from home. Um, that does not have to stop you from giving. We give back to the God who has given us so many gifts. So will you stand and sing the doxology with me, number 95. Closing hymn this morning is number 333. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing.
Reverend Strother, can you give us a benediction? Sure, can I sure thing. I invite you now to receive this benediction, this dismissal with blessing. May God, this, this is a Franciscan benediction, by the way. May God bless you with this comfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger. Anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears. Tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with foolishness. Foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others say cannot be done. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.